Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. On today's show, we offer three reports from the files of IANS. First, a car crash sends the experiencer into the light and beauty of heaven to undergo a life review and 60 years of learning. Second, a woman dying from Hodgkin's disease dissipates like mist into the reality of consciousness and love not bound by time and feels the reality is pleased to be perceived. Third, a man recalls his out-of-body experiences as a three-year-old and then tells how he was pinned in a tractor rollover where he sees deceased family members and a tube portal to a heaven of love. This story is uh, about a woman who, following an accident, spent 60 years in heaven and learned everything there was to know about the universe. At least it felt that way to her. When she sent, was sent back to her body, it was difficult to fit into although she'd really only been gone 30 minutes in Earth time. She shares some of the things she learned, for example, that nothing is right or wrong, and that there is no time. She explains that our body filters reality while we are in our bodies, and it creates the appearance of linear time. She affirms that we choose our lives and that everything that happens is essential for our learning. So this experiencer writes, it was a warm, sunny a- Sunday afternoon of the Labor Day long weekend of 1977. My friend and co-worker picked me up to go to a barbecue at a friend's house. As we were proceeding through the intersection, a sports car ran the light and slammed right into the side of us. I remember hearing a crunch of metal and a huge jolt as we skidded toward the curb. Then everything slowed down, and I remember watching the windshield shatter in slow motion. It looked like frost forming on glass. I looked out the passenger window and watched as the concrete light pole got closer and closer. I knew I wouldn't have a chance of getting out of this alive. As that thought was in my mind, everything stopped. No sound, no movement. Everything seemed suspended in midair. I felt a presence surround me and then a swooshing sound like helicopter blades were really close. All of a sudden, I was moving up really fast. I felt like I was being embraced very gently. Someone or something was holding me, and I knew I would be okay. The sound got louder, and we went faster. All I could see or sense was white light, very bright, but I could look at it, no problem. I remember looking up and seeing white, then looking down and seeing the accident scene. It was surreal. I felt a huge sense of peace and calmness. I knew everything would be fine. We arrived at the foot of a very large cobblestone path. Ahead, I could see a large city to the left and a beautiful field to the right. A babbling stream ran along the path. The city was constructed of luminescent glass. The building shimmered in radiant colors I had never seen before. I could see children. Adults, cats, dogs, birds, butterflies, lots of butterflies, and every kind of animal playing and singing in the meadow. I wanted to immediately join them. It was then I could see my guide, for lack of a better word. He was very handsome and about 30, 35 years old. He was dressed in a brown beige robe, and I immediately knew that I knew him. He said, he smiled and said, Actually, it was telepathic. Come on, follow me. I was led to one of the buildings. As we approached, the buildings got higher and higher until they disappeared into the clouds. We entered into what looked like uh, a library of sorts. It had multiple level levels, and what looked to be uh, um, it had multiple levels, and it was made of marble and dark wood. All I could see were scrolls from top to bottom. Most were rolled, some were cloth, some were raspy paper, some were flat and etched in marble. It was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. 
Lots of people were there bustling around. They all looked at me and seemed very happy to see me. Some even cheered. I was then led to a room that resembled a conservatory. As soon as I was left alone, the walls came to life. 360 degrees of movies all projected at once. I watched the domino effect of what harsh and unkind words and actions would do to people, how it would start with one person and spiral down to 300 people. I felt the anger and sadness of everyone. I thought I was going to explode. I was emotionally shaken to the core. That was the only semi-negative thing that happened to me during my visit there. I was asked to return to the library as we were, as I was to start my studies. As in reading the scrolls, it was more like downloading into my consciousness, I read and studied there for 60 years. Most were people's lives from beginning to end. I was allowed to feel the emotions of most people. Some were vibrant, some were sort of boring. A lot that was downloaded was information. Now, this will be hard to explain, but I'll do my best. We here on Earth have a role to play. We choose our lives even before we are born. Whether we chose a good life or a bad one, it matters not because there is no good or bad. It's just your chosen role. And all lives lived are essentially for our evolution and development. That's why we have memory. We learn and grow because we have different lifestyles, beliefs, opinions, etc. Sorry to say this, but even the most evil, death, destruction, disease, is essential. Well, think about it. If, if everything was always good and going your way, if all relationships were good and everyone got what they wanted over the years, it would get pretty boring and stagnant. I know it sounds wonderful, but it wouldn't let us grow very much, would it? Also, something else that might be hard to comprehend is that there is no such thing as time. Your life is happening all at once, meaning your past, present, future are all one bubble. It's our brain, our filter, that makes the so-called time linear. Huh? I know. Strange. That might raise questions of free will. Do we have it? Yes and no. Just because your life is predetermined, you don't know what the outcome will be. Things can change on a dime. Always remember that. I knew everything about the universe. Why? How? What's the point of it all? I was there for so long it was hard not to know everything. When I returned, I couldn't remember a lot of information that I had received. I assumed it was intentional. I will never forget when I was told I had to go back. I was stunned. I wanted to stay. I argued. I didn't win. I made a deal, though, that when I did return, I would stay. But I guess I had said that before, apparently, many times. So I had to squeeze my big uh, expanse back into that tiny body that was by now halfway laying outside the wrecked car. I couldn't fit very well. It took me six months to get comfortable. I came to in the ambulance. The EMT was glad to see me, and he said my friend that was driving spent three months in the hospital, broken pelvis, arm, femur, crushed foot. I walked away without a scratch. The insurance adjuster was amazed I got out alive, let alone nothing broken. Huh? Imagine that. So now you know time is irrelevant. 60 years in heaven, 30 minutes on earth time. So that about concludes my experience. Lots of other things happened there, but this is long enough, L-O-L. And then the writer has a footnote. Uh, the footnote says, I decided to share this after almost 40 years because of an odd series of events that happened to me recently. The main one was I discovered who my guide was. He was with me the whole time I was there. When I retired, I returned to my small hometown and I happened to walk by a church. I looked toward it and then it hit me. My guide was a friend and schoolmate that had passed when he was 12 years old. It was him, without a doubt in my mind. I knew, I knew him. And there, that story ends. 
The next story, a woman describes what it was like to almost die of a disease. This account is unusual because few NDE narratives describe the death process this way. Although she does not report seeing or hearing anyone, the feeling, nature of the new reality she was engulfed within was enough. She sensed things she was not told and knew how much she was loved and delighted in. She felt she made the ultimate sacrifice by coming back, and she felt the loss acutely after she returned. The uh, experiencer writes, I had Hodgkin's disease and was on chemotherapy. I had bad pulmonary toxicity, uh, severe anemia and fluid around my lungs and heart. I went into respiratory failure while lying alone on the sofa one Saturday morning. Everything, including me, dissipated, became like mist. And I could see beyond the mist, although I wasn't really seeing anymore. It was more like knowing what was beyond the mist that made up my body, the sofa, the room, the universe, everything. I slowly realized that these things were insubstantial, and that there was only one reality, and I could sense the reality behind the insubstantiality of matter. The reality was very strong, overwhelming, in fact, and singular. It had, it had consciousness, it was alive, and it had personality, it had characteristics. These were obvious, kindness, joy, love. It was as approachable and immediately lovable as a kitten. It was clear that the reality was interacting with me, that its attention was directed toward me, although I had the sense that it looked at everything simultaneously in the same way. The reality was not bound by time. Strangely, neither was I. The quality of its attention was like that of a new mother holding her long-awaited firstborn child. Love, joy, delight, fascination, indulgence. I got the sense that it was pleased to be perceived. I did not feel separate from that reality. I felt myself coalesce with it and realized that I had always been embedded within it, bathed in it, cradled by it. As I melted, I was deeply ashamed to have so profoundly underestimated the love and joy of the reality. I wanted to give it something. I told it that I was sorry to have underestimated its kindness and that I wanted to give it something, anything. I would even go back if, if it wanted me to for the tiniest reason at all. I said this because it was the biggest sacrifice I could think of, never ever wanting to feel separate from the reality again snuggled up so safely and so joyfully in it. I had no desire for anything else ever again. Time had no meaning. The fog reformed and rebuilt the world. Gently, I was back in my body. I cried for weeks. And now our third NDE. This man had two experiences one in 1945-46 at age three, and one in 2009. He shares both and how they changed him and what he does. Fascinating is his story of the tree that figures prominently in his first experience and its implications for our understanding of time. Like uh, other child experiencers, he assumed other people were like him, but recently realized that the amazing spiritual experiences he has had his whole life are not the norm. Aspects of his second experience are hard to explain, but he seems to have figured most of them out. His miraculous healing from spinal injury seems to have been good, seems to have been in good hands from at least one angel holding his head and one doctor from the other side. The experiencer writes, I had a new pole barn built in January 2009. I was eager to grade around the foundation to prevent water from entering the barn. I was frustrated because it had rained for most of January and February, and now that we were finally into March, I had hoped for drier weather. Sure enough, we had been without rain for five days, but now it was threatening to rain again in the evening, so I was trying to finish grading before dinner. I didn't realize how important that this day would be in my life. That afternoon in early March, I had a near-death experience. 
The question for me is not only how has it changed me, but in addition, how has it changed the way I do what I do? I'm a part-time hospital chaplain, and how I deal with death has changed, and I have changed. But before I get into my experience, I want to back up to 1945-46. I was three at the time, and in the attic with my mother. Even to this day, I can remember very clearly every detail of what happened. She was upset and looking for some clothes she had placed up there. I was walking around holding my pillow. I loved to feel the soft fabric and was holding the pillow in front of me. The next thing I remember is being up in a large tree in our front yard next to the walk and watching my mother run out of our house toward uh, our next door neighbor's house. I wondered what she was carrying in her arms. Then I realized it was me she was carrying. I wasn't concerned, I just watched. The next thing I remember is being slammed down and water running over my face. I opened my eyes and saw that I was on the countertop with my head in the sink. My mother told me later that I fell over the protective railing around the steps and landed on the steps some 10 feet below. For years, I never told anyone about my experience. One thing that puzzled me about this fall was the tree I was in while my mother ran next door. We didn't have a tree in our front yard next to the walk. I remember later when my father wanted to plant a tree, he asked where we thought uh, would be the best place to plant the tree. And I immediately responded and was very determined that the tree be planted next to the walk. I was so insistent that he planted the tree in the exact spot I requested. As the years rolled on, I would often look at the tree and think to myself that the tree used to be bigger. I've come to believe that this experience opened the door to God in a way that has allowed me to have some amazing spiritual experiences. I thought these were common to all individuals, but it has only been recently that I've come to know that what I have experienced my entire life is a very special blessing. With this as a backdrop, let me move into my NDE, which I stated earlier was in March of 2009. It was a Monday afternoon around 5.30 p.m., and I was on my tractor, the one equipped with a front end loader and a snow blade in the back. I was moving some dirt around the foundation of our new barn. It was my last load before going in for supper. Somehow something went wrong, and I heard this inner voice scream, jump. I've been driving tractors for years, and I've never even thought of jumping off a tractor, especially while it's moving. But I jumped. I suddenly found myself face down in the dirt. At first, I didn't think I was hurt and tried to jump up to assess the damage of the tractor. That is when I realized I was unable to get up or even move. I had the full weight of the tractor roll, roll bar on the small of my back. I never felt the roll bar hit my back, so I was surprised that I was pinned down. It was as if the angels had cushioned the fall of the tractor on me. Then I realized I was having trouble breathing, and it was getting worse by the minute. I instantly knew I was going to die. I told God I I didn't want to die, curled up under my tractor. I wanted to be in my wife's arms with our children and grandchildren surrounding us. I started yelling for help but no one heard me. I was on the back side of the barn, unable to see our house or the yard. At one point, I looked over to see the tractor and saw my front yard. It was beautiful with all kinds of flowers. It was filled with people, young and old, having a great time. There was so much laughter and happiness. I thought that God was showing me that I was going to make it and I would be in my front yard again. I now realize that I couldn't have seen my front yard from where I was pinned down. I have come to believe that I saw a piece of heaven. I also remember seeing my parents walking toward me. They were smiling and holding hands with a small girl. I've come to think that that the child was the child they lost in a pregnancy between my sister and me. As all this was going on, I realized I had to calm myself and concentrate on breathing. Each breath was getting harder and harder. 
I pleaded with God to not let me die, but I knew I couldn't last much longer. I prayed and asked God to forgive me for all my sins. I said goodbye to my family and uh, close friends. I pictured each one as I told them I loved them and asked God to surround them with his loving light of protection. I got to the point that I couldn't hold out anymore. It was getting so hard to breathe and I was out of energy. I finally turned my face to the right and put my head down and closed my eyes knowing it was the end. That's when I heard the inner voice say, look for the light. I looked and saw an opening with a light at the far end. It was just a short distance away from where I was. Now, I had read every book I could find about NDEs and knew about the tunnel and the light. But what I saw wasn't a tunnel like I had read about, but rather a large tube that was bending and twisting around. The best description I can give is that it looked like a very large clothes dryer vent tube. It was spinning and angels were all around it. It looked like an upside down t uh, tornado with a large end at the bottom. I thought that it must be a portal to heaven. I was amazed to see the cover of the winter 2010 Vital Signs publication for there on the cover page was a picture of the tube I saw. I floated to the opening of the tube. I must confess that I first looked into the tube to see if it was going up, not down. Before I started to float into the tube, as I entered the tube, I realized that I didn't hurt anymore and I wasn't having trouble breathing. I've never felt such love, compassion, understanding, and calmness in my life. All my worries about those I was leaving behind were gone. I now know the meaning of the peace that surpasses all understanding. I knew that God was asking me if I loved, and I accepted his love. Then I heard Carol, my wife, calling me to dinner. Her voice was very different, but at the same time, it was the same. It was as if the angels were shouting with her. All at once, I felt I was yanked out of the tube and slammed under the roll bar and grasping for every breath again. That was the first time I felt the weight of the tractor on my back, and it was excruciating. I yelled for help, but I didn't think Carol heard me. I couldn't yell very loud because I didn't have much breath. I didn't think she heard me. I was desperate and prayed even harder to God to help me. What a relief it was when I heard Carol's voice just around the corner of the barn asking, Jack, where are you? She had heard me after all and came running. At first she tried to lift the tractor herself. She tried so hard that she bruised her arms. The tractor was way too heavy and she couldn't budge it. She found a steel pipe and wedged it under the tractor and against a tree and was able to move the tractor just a fraction of an inch but it was enough to let me get a little more breath so I could hold on. She went running f for the phone and called 911. As she ran back, I could hear the dispatcher talking to her. Carol had the phone on speaker. I could hear the sirens in the distance and knew they would be here soon. Then I found myself standing out in front of the barn watching the ambulance drive up to the back of our house. I was upset that they were turning around and backing down to the edge of our parking pad. I was yelling at them to hurry up that every second counted and pointed to where I lay under the tractor. It took four or five of them to lift the tractor just enough so they could pull me out. They quickly cut my clothes off, and I heard one of them say, My God, look at his spine. The next thing I remember was being carried to the waiting ambulance. There was a pair of hands holding my head. I was jostled as they carried me up the hill, but the hands never moved. I wondered at the time if the hands might be of an angel. As they loaded me into the ambulance, I heard a man say that he was a doctor and that he would be with me uh, in shock trauma. I never heard or saw him again. I've been told there wasn't a doctor at the scene. They loaded me into the ambulance for a quick ride to the helicopter. I was flown to the shock trauma unit in Baltimore. I don't remember much about the ride, only the takeoff and landing. As we landed, the shock trauma staff was waiting for me. The staff surrounded the stretcher and started running, pushing me as fast as they could. Everyone was asking me questions at once, and I couldn't remember the answers. They were prepared to do surgery, and I was x-rayed, CAT scanned, probed, and prodded by multiple hands. All at once, I kept asking them to give me something 
to help me breathe. Although I was uh, out from under the tractor, I was still having trouble breathing. They told me they couldn't give me anything until the test results were back. When the results of the tests came back, everyone just stared at me. There was no damage to any part of my body. The blood tests did show that I'd had muscle and tissue damage, so they kept me overnight in shock trauma to monitor me. They told me that if my numbers kept going up, that they would uh, have to do exploratory surgery to find out where I was bleeding. When they finally let Carol come in to be with me, she told me about all of our friends that came to the waiting room to be with us during the crisis. I was overwhelmed with emotion, knowing that so many had come running to be with us, and at the same time I felt bad that I couldn't see them. The hospital only allowed two visitors at a time, and I, I couldn't let go of Carol and my son for fear I wouldn't see them again. Knowing that our friends were in the waiting room and praying for us meant so much to me. I also knew the request for prayers had gone out on our church prayer chain even before I was in the ambulance. On the day of my discharge, three doctors, one at a, uh, a time, came in to examine me and see for themselves that I wasn't hurt. The last doctor turned to me on, on her way out the door and asked, you are one lucky guy to escape without major damage. I said, no, doctor, I'm not lucky. I'm very blessed, realizing I had received a miracle. She paused for a moment and then said very slowly and thoughtfully, I think you're correct. About a year later, just following our, our uh, four-foot snowstorm, I was in the hardware store picking up some items when I heard this voice behind me say, you be careful on that tractor with all that snow. I turned around and saw the medic who was with the team that rescued me. He asked how much permanent damage I had in my back as the result of the tractor accident when I told him none. In fact, I didn't even have a bruise. He was astonished. He said, it sure wasn't a pretty sight when they pulled you out. How has this experience changed me? For starters, I think I have been changed starting with my out-of-body experience as a child. I've always been comfortable with death in grade school. I went to a parochial school. I was the one the priest would call out to serve at funerals. I've always been on a spiritual quest. I was raised in a very conservative Irish Catholic family. As I grew, I realized the Catholic faith didn't fit for me, and I needed something more. I searched, then found and joined an independent church. The church provided me with a lot of what I was looking for. I looked uh, for ways to give back to others and became a volunteer pastoral visitor in the hospital. I volunteered for 17 years, and then seven years ago, I was offered a part-time staff position as a chaplain. I've been on staff ever since. After my 2009 NDE, things got a lot more spiritual for me, although I still belong to the same church. I have not been as involved as I was before. I also have become a lot more active in the hospital. My wife wouldn't let, let me go back to work until the bruises on her arms went away. The first day I was back to work after my NDE, I was on call. I got a call in the middle of the night and was asked to come to the hospital to be with a patient who was dying. I asked the daughter who called what she would like me to do. And she said, prepare the way for my mother. I went to the hospital and was with the patient who only had a short time to live. I asked her how I could help her, and she said, tell me what it is like to die. I told her that I could tell her about my near-death experience, which I did. At the end, she said that my story helped her a lot, and she died that evening. A few years before my NDE in 2009, while taking a ride, my granddaughter asked me to show her the house I grew up in. I took her by the house and noticed the tree in the front yard was as big as I remembered it from my first out-of-body experience when I was three. Following my NDE, I had an occasion to drive past the house again, and to my surprise, I saw that the tree had been cut down. I thought this was symbolic and realized the connection between my two experiences I am on a journey toward God, and I'm not afraid of death, for I have been shown what to expect. My thanks to the International Association for Near-Death Studies for these stories and for all they do, and thanks to you for listening. If you'd like to hear this show again or any of our more than 500 archived 
ad-free NDE interviews, go to Talk Zone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button, or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone, for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying once again, thanks for listening.